This is Dr. James Wilcox, and today we will demonstrate a basic wrist ultrasound. We will be going over the dorsal wrist, looking at radius fractures, wrist diffusion, tendon disruption, and deeper veins, and the volar wrist, looking at carpal tunnel syndrome, radius, scaphoid, and pisiform fractures. First, we'll start at Lister's tubercle, which can easily be palpated on the dorsal side of the wrist. And we'll put our gel on Lister's tubercle which will be our home base for looking at the dorsal side of the wrist. Make sure when you're doing point of care ultrasound that you always identify the marker dot and place that on the right side of the patient. So we'll start at Lister's tubercle. It's going to be a triangle shaped cortical bone in the center of the screen here. We're going to evaluate the radius for any signs of cortical disruption, which could be a fracture. So we're going to look both distally and proximally, looking for any signs of cortex disruption, which could signify a fracture. Then we'll look at the radius and long axis. We can scan both back and forth and up and down, looking at any signs of cortical disruption signifying a fracture. Next, we'll look at the radiocarpal joint by going just distal to Lister's tubercle. And a joint effusion would be a black anechoic spot in between the radius and the carpal joints. And remember, an effusion on ultrasound can be from many different things, so make sure you put it in clinical context. Then we can look at the ulna in long axis for any signs of a fracture, which would be a cortical disruption. And we can go ahead and rotate the probe 90 degrees and evaluate the ulna in short axis as well. Again, looking for any kind of disruption in the cortex. Next, we can look at the extensor tendons in the hand, looking for any site of disruption in the fibrillar structure. As he wiggles his fingers, you can see the tendons moving back and forth. And we can evaluate each tendon, both in short axis, both proximal and distally across the wrist. And if there's one particular tendon that we're interested in evaluating, we can look at it in long axis as well for any change in that or disruption in that typical cable-like fibrillar structure. Next, we will evaluate the radial side of the wrist, looking at the first dorsal compartment. This is the site of Decorine's tenosynovitis. And we can look at both tendons for any signs of anechoic black fluid, which would be a sign of synovitis. Summary of the dorsal wrist evaluation can be seen on the screen. And next, what we'll do is have our patient supinate his hand so we can evaluate the volar side of the wrist. We start at the distal wrist crease, which is the carpal tunnel inlet. And first we'll be looking for the median nerve, which is a honeycomb structure at the very top of the carpal tunnel. As we wag the probe back and forth, the tendons will become bright and dark, whereas the median nerve stays the same. And as he moves his fingers back and forth, we'll see the tendons bounce up and down, whereas the median nerve stays on the superficial side of the carpal tunnel. Then we can move the probe more proximally and watch as the median nerve dives down deep into the muscle. As we come back more distally in the carpal tunnel, the median nerve comes back to the superficial side of the carpal tunnel. Usually we measure the median nerve at about 10 millimeters in the carpal tunnel. Anything larger would be pathologic. Another pathologic finding is a change of more than 5 millimeters between the distal and proximal median nerve. Next, we can look at the scaphoid on the radial side of the wrist. Typically, we will rotate the probe somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees in order to get the scaphoid in long axis. And then we can, again, like the other bones, evaluate the cortex of the bone to see if there's any disruption within the scaphoid cortex, which would signify a potential fracture.
We can also evaluate the radius on the volar side as well, going both proximal and distal, looking for any signs of cortical disruption, which would indicate a radial fracture. And we can also evaluate the ulna in the same fashion, going both proximally and distally, looking for any signs of disruption. And finally, on the ulnar side, we can look at the pisiform bone to see if there's any sign of fraction on the pisiform. It's a summary of the volar side of the wrist. Thank you for watching.